the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story, and this is my backstory with Josh Boyer. Boyer. And boom, here we go. Episode number, uh, I got to think about this for a second. I think it's episode 12, actually. Yeah, 12. <laughs> um, I'm here with Rory Hamill here in uh, Tom's River, New Jersey. I just uh, I flew into Philly yesterday, drove to New York, uh, got stuck in some amazing Manhattan traffic, and I uh, worked my way over to Rye Brook, and now I'm back in New Jersey to do this podcast with Rory, and I'm super, super pumped to uh, hear your story. Um I listened to your podcast that you did with SOF Bad Monkey, and so I got a, a little taste of kind of some of the things that you're up to and what you're doing, and I, I'm excited to for you to share your story because I think, you know, like we talked about previously, like uh, earlier today or like five minutes ago, um, about mindset and kind of like the way that I do things, and I'm sure you and I are very similar. So um, I'm going to let him share his backstory and let Roy share like kind of where he grew up, his military experience, uh, what happened while he was in the military. Um and how that shaped his upbringing, his military experience, how that all shaped who he is today and what he's up to. So go ahead, brother. Take it away, man. Let's, share, let's hear your backstory. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, um, man. Well, I grew up uh, down the road in Brick, New Jersey. And uh, based off of what I can gather, I had like a fairly, you know, normal average upbringing. Uh, I, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of, kids in our generation had parents that didn't quite know what the hell they were doing oh, and sure. uh <laughs> so i mean that, that was something that i didn't really figure out until uh i went to therapy years later but that that's a how little, old are you now uh, i'm 30 years old okay cool. um so there was my parents were they 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 fell into the mindset of like you know let's stick it out for the kids and everything like that um, but looking back at it now, that did a lot more harm than good. Yeah. Um, they they stayed together all the way up until actually a month before my first divorce uh-huh. is when my parents got divorced. Uh-huh. So it was yeah, it was like a back to back thing. Did you guys plan that? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> um, but it was it was just like walking on eggshells my entire life, and I didn't. Know, I thought it was normal. I thought that everything that was happening to me um, and my younger brother and sister was normal. I obviously got the brunt of it because I was the oldest and I I took it willingly um, because I felt I was also kind of trained in a way that, you know, the oldest has the most responsibility. The oldest will always, you know, take the brunt of the, you know, punishments. You have brothers and sisters or all brothers, all sisters? Um, I have a younger sister who's two years younger than me, a brother who's four years younger than me. And then I also have a half brother who is 25 years younger than me. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. My dad got remarried and had another kid. Good for him, man. Yeah. Well, um, so there was, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that I figured out, um, shouldn't have been done. Uh, I used to obviously get beat with belts wooden slotted spoons i'm sure like most of us had as kids you know um the big kicker for me and me being an emotional person and uh a very mindful person even since a young age the thing that really fucked me up the most that i found out was getting locked in the closet for several hours with no light um so it was akin to sensory deprivation torture right was that your dad or your mom that was was my dad my dad kind of spurred it and he was the one that said do this do this do this and my mom i think did it kind of out of like fear of him it was it was weird i he was very mentally abusive in a lot of ways and on the other side of the coin he was more of a do as i say not as i do kind of guy and he taught me a lot of good virtues and a lot of good qualities you know he he always always harped on uh discipline hard work and he showed me that Right. Like I started working at the age of 12 in, in the kitchen with him. Our family had a deli down in brick and like he showed me all these qualities and I, I exemplified them and I, I tried to emulate him, you know, obviously being the firstborn and everything. Yeah. But there was a lot of stuff that, you know, looking back at it, 
it just it, there was a lot of shady shit that he was doing too yeah and there was a lot of shit that he did to me that you shouldn't be doing to fucking kids and that goes for my mom too there's no excuse um have you rectified that with your dad have you like reconciled with no him that's or? that's actually uh that's something i'm working towards uh i don't know if <laughs> if it'll ever get to that point um i'm of the mindset now that i'm not really gonna seek anything out i'm, I'm just gonna let whatever will be will be um i'm right now at this point in my life um with everything that i got going on all i'm trying to do right now is just get my message out there in the hopes that if it even helps one person that it'll be worth it yeah, um both man i love that shit. i mean i i was for years and years uh just sitting on my ass living a sedentary lifestyle feeling very sorry for myself and I, I was extremely overweight i was not exercising i was drinking like a fish I, I wasn't doing anything for myself i wasn't being a good father um and it wasn't that i was uh you know bad to my children or anything like that it was i i wasn't showing up for them as much as i should have yep. and whether or not i realized that that was affecting me subconsciously and that's also you know through therapy that's also how I figured out, you know, what my parents were doing to me and, you know, all, all the, the models of parenting and marriage and all that shit, I got those from my parents. And uh, so needless to say, when I enlisted at 17, um, this was on the tail end of, you know, a string of shitty decisions through high school, which culminated with me getting arrested for federal grand larceny. Now the, that the high school that happened is actually right across the intersection. Is it like, really? Yeah, it's like <laughs> you could throw a rock at it. Thug. <laughs> <laughs> so I got I got kicked out of my senior Donovan High School. I went to Catholic school my whole life, and Catholic kids are the worst. Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys getting so yeah. much shit, dude. It's yeah. crazy. Well, I mean, it's it's like a, I don't know. They <laughs> they try to restrict us with a lot of stuff i so. think that's i think that's probably why dude they were they, those guys are like rebelling yeah, it's those just like with, with parenting so if you do that with parenting if you tell a kid no 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 the kid's gonna be like okay do the yeah, and, and then go and try and do it totally you can't tell a kid no but um so i got arrested for that <laughs> and what it wasn't even anything malicious it was i just stole laptops from the high school right. and sold them on ebay um but it was federal because i sold it to a dude in hong kong so it crossed international boundaries uh -huh. and then there was this thing with the property value i don't remember all the details but long story short i had already started the maps process over here at fort dix and the judge um <laughs> he asked if i had anything to say for myself um because he was about to do sentencing and i said uh sir uh <laughs> you know if there's any leniency you could give me um i would greatly appreciate it i'm about to go to marine corps boot camp and he just laughed at me that's awesome. He's like, huh? Hey, all right, have fun. I'm gonna, I'm giving you six months probation. I'm gonna expunge it from your record, uh, with uh, you know, six months successful probation. Super lucky, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was 17. I had no record. Right. It, it was just, you know, it was, it is what it is. Um, I know that I was very fortunate, very lucky, and the quality of people that I was hanging out with at that point too. It, it I wouldn't have wound up where I am today. Yeah. It, I would have gone. I shit. I probably might not even be alive. Most of the people around here that I grew up with, uh, they got heavy into drugs. Um, it seems every year there's like one or two that OD. Yeah. And what is it? Is it like an opiate crisis? It's yeah, right here in this town. There's this is like a hub. That's a trip, you know, because I, I had buddies in the military that were from the East Coast. And I remember even <laughs> back then um, them talking about like oxys and you know, yeah. taking oxys. And I think it was like a substitute for heroin so people started getting on yep. oxycontin and it was cheaper and easier to to get because people were getting prescriptions like fucking no other with which is a whole nother story but yeah um it's crazy though to think that man all these people like that are your age my age i'm, I'm six years older than you but it was uh it's an epidemic man yeah it needs to stop but unfortunately some people don't get help soon enough and then it's too late you know yeah it's fucking That's sad it. yeah and i it's but it's like not surprising to me you know, the what do you think it is what do you think that causes that that uh I, need I, for i think a lot of it comes from their family lives our family lives right. like a lot of us don't like for i'm i'm only speaking from my personal experience and based off of what i've seen from the people back here right. um in this area individuals like myself are an anomaly like we don't we don't generally go 
you know, into the military and succeed and come out the other side through, you know, massive amounts of trauma and, you know, can still fucking walk down the street with our head held high. And we, we don't have a drug problem. It's, it's, it's very, very hard to find someone like us in this area. Right. Um, a lot of the people, they just, they left, they never left here. They, they stayed here, you know, is the, the land that time forgot. Yeah. But you know how it is though. Like if you go on a deployment yeah. and you come back home and you're like, so, so what happened? You know, what's going on? And they're like, well, nothing. Yeah, I, I, I worked at IHOP and yeah. that's it. Like, I remember feeling like such like uh what do they call it? a culture fo- shock. No, well, like FOMO, right? Was it the kids were saying? Oh, fear of missing yeah, out. Fear yeah. of missing out. So like <laughs> I was like, I always had like uh this fear of missing out when I was uh in England and I would come back home on leave or whatever and I would see like guys that I grew up with, girls I grew up with that I'm not missing much. I mean, they're just doing the standard shit. I mean, and there's still people they're still doing the same shit. I mean, after all these years, I like, still doing the same shit. That yeah, you that, doing and that twenty years ago, that really, that really fucked with me for a while too, because it was like, how, how the fuck, you're the same age as me, huh? and I've already gone to combat, gotten married, and have a kid, huh? and like, I'm in my mind, I'm this full grown adult, and then by all, by all means, I am, you know, not that I was mentally there yet, right, but all the responsibilities were there, you know, and it's it was very very difficult and it was one of those things they could never understand and still to this day they can't understand and i mean i've lost a lot of friendships fell out of a lot of friendships uh burned a couple bridges um just over the course of the years going through my process right you know my growth and like the the person you see right now sitting before you was not i was not always like this i was i was i was really a fucking wreck and it all it just it came together last year but uh so share that story like what like <sighs> you, i mean you went from being 17 did you know like you had, you got busted but you had already gone to maps so you're already in that process yeah like what what was kind of pushing you to go to, did you just want to get away did you know you wanted to get away so that's why you're joining the marines or what um part of it was 9 11 yeah um, because in this area in this county especially a lot of people commuted and they still do. They commute up to New York City to work. Um, so that hit this area, you know, really heavy. Um, that was one factor. The other factor was both my parents were in the Navy. Right. Um, they were both cryptological linguists. They met at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey. Uh, one thing led to another. And then that's how my mom got pregnant with me. Um, my mom opted to get out after two years. Because I guess back then you could get out if, if you were, were pregnant. pregnant. You still can, I think. Can you? Yeah, pretty, oh. Well, when I was getting out, like you could still get out if you were pregnant. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what she told me. So <clears throat> she got out. My dad stayed in. Um, got stationed at Fort Meade. And he started doing some work uh, on base there. And then I was born at Walter Reed. Army, okay. And so it was It was like a full, you know, circle. Full circle like, yeah. It was really, really cool. Uh. I mean, the, not it wasn't cool given the circumstances. It was, but looking back now, it's really cool that I was born there, and that I was reborn there in a sense. Yeah, for sure. But um, yeah, seventeen, I'm enlisted. I had to get a waiver. Um, I had to get two waivers, obviously, because of the getting arrested and shit. I had to go before a major up in Red Bank and got my ass chewed out. And I didn't even know what an ass chewing was at this point because I'm still just this young, you know, kid. You got knife handed already, dude. Yeah, I was getting knife handed and screamed at. And I (laughs) I put my hands in my pockets when I stood before this guy and he's like, get your fucking hands out of your pockets. I'm like, yes, sir. Uh, Like, I I didn't know what the fuck I was doing, you know? (laughs) So, took my ass chewing. That was my first ass chewing before I even went to Paris Island. First of many, I'm sure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um. Did the whole thing at Paris Island, you know, the whole disorientation up for 36 hours, sitting in an airport, then get off the bus at four o'clock in the morning, kind of bullshit. And right. uh, then they kept us up for like 36 more hours. And, you know, it's just fucking crappy. And in that moment, you're you're kind of like, what the fuck am I doing? Why did I do this? You yeah. know, every every person that goes through that thinks that at some point. And I think that's every branch because I know like yeah. going to the Air Force, like it's not that. I mean, everyone talks shit, you know, like, oh, Air Force boot camp's a joke or, you know, Marine boot camp's the hard, hardest. I mean, it, it's all, it all sucks equally, yeah, I think, you know, but shit. I think that uh, we all go through that moment of time where we like stop for a second. You're like, dude, what in the fuck am I doing? Dude? Mm-hmm. Why, why and how am I here right now? Yeah. But yeah, anyway, you just go through it though. You kind of, you just do it and you're like, all right, whatever, <laughs> man, it is what it is. 
but I it just I remember thinking it was like the hardest thing I'd, and it was you know it was the hardest thing I'd ever done at that point and I thought you know, well if I can get through this then I can get through anything you know it's it's not a big deal and then I went to you know Iraq and I was like okay this is yeah whatever but right before Iraq I uh so this this uh girl that kind of grew up with but didn't really know um we made contact um she got pregnant so i did what i felt was the right thing you know based off of how my irish catholic family kind of fucking imposed upon me so i said you know what i'm let's go get married um and we did that at the courthouse it's kind of like a shotgun wedding in my mind um but i did it nonetheless because i was about to deploy yeah and you know and if not for anything else just so my my daughter you know, would would have had any benefits if something should happen to me. God forbid. Yeah, it's admirable, actually. So, um, no, I mean, everyone, everyone that I know would have done that. It's right. most people do, do that. Um, it wasn't really anything out of the ordinary. It was an 18 year old kid. I was at that point. I was, you know, dumb. Didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Plus, it's like more BAH and yeah, you know, and it, you're like, oh, more money. Fuck yeah, you right. get paid like twice the amount, and you're like, this is awesome. Yeah, it's, no, awesome. it's, it's fucking stupid. Yeah. And I really wish I would have waited. But on the other side of that, I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I went through that. Yeah. Um, because now I, you know, now I know what to look for and you know what to appreciate when it comes to my relationship. So totally. Um, anyway, so I go through that. Uh, miss the birth of my first child because i was in iraq it was pretty light deployment we didn't really get into too much contact the only thing that really happened was at the end of the deployment we were doing a left seat right seat um yale and harder they got the navy crosses posthumously they stopped a, a dump truck uh v-bid um mm-hmm. at the entry control point i think there was uh I want to say about 50 Marines and Iraqi police. And th- there was a shitload of people in this compound. Right. And they stopped them with a saw. And I think a saw and a rifle or two saws, something like that. But anyway, the light weaponry. The guy had a drop dead switch, detonated. Um, and they got killed. So they got the Navy crosses posthumously. In my yeah. opinion, they should have gotten the fucking Medal of Honor. Right. Because that's Medal of Honor shit right there. Definitely. Like they didn't fucking move at all. They have camera footage of it. Like they had a security camera on the entry control point. They didn't fucking move. It always gives me the chills, like when I hear stories like that, because it makes me, I guess, proud to be an American, to know that like we have guys and girls that sign up, they volunteer to go sign up to do jobs like this. Yeah. And when they are in situations like that and they rise to the fucking occasion, dude. Yeah. And there's no backing down. It's not like, um, you know, because you you could do, I mean, when you're scared, dude, it's like fight or flight. I mean, Mm -hmm. I would say that large majority of people are running, dude. It's 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 running, but not in that environment, dude. No, you, I mean you. We, I personally have seen maybe one or two people kind of like like freeze up, but yeah, yeah, for the most part, everyone that you know had been in a combat situation that I was next to performed admirably, and they they did so with complete disregard for their own well being. Right. Like, and I know that's like what you hear in a fucking citation, but it's it's really fucking true. And, and there's. There's so many things that went unrecognized, and that, that's a huge problem too in the Marine Corps infantry. Yeah. We don't get recognized for shit, man. Yeah. Like I, I know myself and a couple other guys got a certificate of appreciation for saving my team leader's life. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I, I didn't want anything to begin with, right. but don't give me that. You know, just yeah, yeah. don't. You just Makes don't even fucking like give me that insult shit. to injury. Yeah, it's it's like, come on. Go away, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, I remember staring through my fucking platoon commander's soul. I was like, are you fucking kidding me right now? You're yeah. giving me an award for this shit. Like, this, no. Like, anybody else, every week, the whole entire squad performed, and I don't know. But that was on my second deployment, and <laughs> so I, I had then, my then, my first ex-wife, she got pregnant. We were doing the workup and everything like that. We got where we were going to Afghanistan. Originally, it was like, we're going back to Iraq, and we're all like, whatever, fuck this. And then we get told when we were out of 29 Palms doing our, our training out there, um, hey, we're going to Afghanistan. And everyone was like, yeah, fuck yeah. And I, I just remember looking at like a couple of the other guys in the back, and I'm like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is not good. Um, what year is this? This is 2009. Okay. Yeah. So. And you have one kid at this point? Uh, yes. Okay. About to have two. 
So 2009 was when Obama did that huge troop surge um, into Afghanistan. And we were at the tip of Operation Kanjari, which was Operation Strike of the Sword. And they dropped our company down in Southern Helmand. So we, we acclimated at Camp Leatherneck, Camp Bastion, which is a joint U.S. Marine British base. <clears throat> and, you know, we acclimated there for 30 days. We did a lot of training around the, the camp and everything like that. And then um, we got, you know, all our ammo and we started loading up and this is when the reality started to set in all right we're about to go into some shit and we get dropped down there we spread out a lot of us get helo inserted some of us get you know dropped off in trucks and everything like that depending on the company and uh we linked up with the the local brits that were working there and their i guess their uh sop was to just kind of like hold a defensive position so they weren't really going out and probing and you know looking for shit yeah. they were kind of just sitting there um that's what they've been instructed to do that's what they, that's what they were doing um so immediately we go there and we start causing all kinds of shit yeah trying to pick a fight <clears throat> excuse me yeah because that's 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 what we do um <laughs> fucking so, marines can't yeah take you i know so we went looking for trouble but like within a few weeks um in MRAP, uh, the roads past a certain point were too damn narrow, so uh, we couldn't take any any vehicles on the roads. Um, there was a couple certain choke points where the the bank just was too tight. So this MRAP flips into the river, into the canal. Everyone's like, "Fuck, we got to get a wrecker," you know. So they call it out from battalion and everything. And this is the first time that I'd been shot at. Um, so we get called to go out for security um i there was i think another squad was out there already. yeah another squad was out there already and they had already received contact um the night prior and they were sitting there so we come up the next day we're escorting the wrecker up and i remember we came out wide in front of the group and uh so everyone was behind us at this point and then I remember standing in the open field with my squad and we we were spread out, we were dispersed pretty nicely. And then all of a sudden that first crack came and I was like, what the fuck was that? Like mm -hmm. I, had, this is my first time getting shot at. And I was just like, what the, you know, I jumped. And then it, you know, and I was like, fuck. And we started sprinting, we got, we got some cover and then we just started shooting everything. And it's, when it's your first firefight, you just unload. You don't even care about ammo retention. Like you're just shooting and shooting and shooting and you just, any, opening in a wall and you you know you're, you're real trigger happy um could you tell where it was coming from or no barely yeah. it's kind of the direction and you can kind of guess that based off the round and the snap and everything like that and if you hear uh, you know a sound in the uh in the distance like a like that right if you're a snap it's it's pretty damn close to you so and like nothing else so we were trying to uh figure out where it was i don't think we wound up finding i think we just like scared him the fuck off but uh another saw gunner in my squad after and we're walking back he's looking his bipods have been shot oh, like just, shit. yeah and he, he's like oh fuck man <laughs> 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 yeah but um so that was like our first little taste and then it kind of quieted down a little bit we didn't really get into anything and then it was like all right we're gonna do this thing called the push you know which was where this operation came in right. So the point of it was Fox Company would come up, take our position at the patrol baseline. Echo would get inserted via Hilo. I think I want to say it was like 15 clicks down south. And then um, we had to push on foot and meet them, meet right. them in the middle kind of and like join. The how AO. far is that for the people listening? Like how far is that about? Um, in civilian terms. <laughs> yeah. Well, a click is a kilometer, a thousand meters. There you go. Um, shit. I don't even <laughs> math. Like my, no, is it like my, miles apart or is it? It was miles. Yeah, there's. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I suck at math. I suck yeah. at translating. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Um, it was a it was a notable distance down south, several miles, and we had to push to a middle point and set up, take over a compound. Literally, we we had to set up a compound. We had to find the owner, kick them out, and throw them cash and say fuck off. Essentially, oh, like wow. yeah, the, it was. It's kind of fucked up. Like a, totally fucked up. Hey, we're here. We're taking your house over. Fuck off. Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> no wonder we're getting shot at sometimes. Like, <laughs> I, I'd shoot at us too. Like, <laughs> right. what the fuck. 
So we we're going on this push and everything, and we step off and right where you know previously weeks prior that MRAP had flipped, we get past that point, and this is at this point the farthest south we had pushed. So we're going. We're in a uh, we, my squad was the the hunter killer squad, so we were, which meant we were out on the the far side. If anybody on the the convoy or in the middle of the formation, it was like a, a inverted wedge. Um, if anybody got shot at, we were able to swing around and flank them. Okay. So we're pushing and we get blown up instantly. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, luckily, it was buried deep enough. Uh, no one really got anything besides a slight concussion. Um, our TB- squ- TBI? Our, yeah. I mean, everyone got TBI on that fucking deployment. Right. Um, but no one really bitched about it. Yeah. Um, and I'm pretty sure our squad leader at the time, uh, Sergeant Flynn, he got like a tiny piece of shrapnel on his side, Sappy, but that was it. But the entire way down, we were pushing. It was 130 fucking degrees in the shade. Um, there was little to no cover. We were, we were trying to use the compounds for cover as much as we could, um, which is, you know, a double-edged sword because that's a perfect place to booby trap. Totally. You know? Um, so we encountered several IEDs. Um we got shot at uh, several times over the course of two to three days, and mind you, all, while all the t- all the while that we're you know doing this push south, Echo Company is down south. They got Hilo inserted. They're taking contact like crazy down there. Yeah, like e- everyone in the area is you know fighting us, and um, I'm pretty sure Fox Company kind of had it nice and chill. They were just sitting up there holding the line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So we're almost done with the push. Uh, my buddy Leo, he's uh, he's one of my best friends, and I've I've really grown to appreciate his friendship because he's he's been he's one of the few people that has stuck by my side, um, you know, through thick and thin. Uh, but he found a weapons cache accidentally by taking a shit on it. <laughs> oh wow! He took a shit on a pressure plate. <laughs> Oh wow! Which is linked to like a couple one five five shells that we're guarding. Oh shit! Like oh, some shit. some literally. RPGs. No yeah, yeah. Literally, oh shit! Like holy <laughs> fucking shit! He actually got a NAM for that. He got oh. an award for it. Oh, that is amazing. It was a sizable cachet, and he found it on accident by taking a dump on it. It was awesome. Oh man! Yeah. So that, that was, that was gonna be a story for the ages, man. For those grandkids yeah. and everything. It was pretty epic. Yeah. I mean, the, they worded it much much cleaner in the uh, in the citation, but. Right. So that that was that, and then you know we we find a compound, we set up shop, we start doing our thing. You know, it's just constant contact, day in and day out. Um, there was a couple times where we had like some some sizable lulls, but for the most part, it was there was always something happening in our AO. Yeah. Uh, one of our squads was either you know taking pop shots on post. The entry control point was getting shot at up on the road. Um, we would encounter IEDs. Uh, we had EOD with us um, because we were in such an austere place. Like we we weren't able to get resupply, right. so uh, we had e- two EOD techs with us, and they were constantly working. And they they were fucking like props to those guys. They they were constantly working day in and day out. You know, just like all of us were. And you know, a lot of us got broken down in a lot of ways. And when we started losing our buddies, um. You know, it got to a point where just like, fuck this, what are we doing? So morale was pretty much in the dirt. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was really, fu- I, that was the most miserable I'd ever been. I think that's the most miserable I ever will be. Yeah. Um, I'd imagine, dude, like the stress level, the fucking just seeing, like, you know, did you lose any guys at this point? Yeah. We, we lost a couple. And like, the, the times and, and the days and everything as I'm like telling this or it's kind of hard to like line it up neatly. Right. Um, we had lost 14 guys on that deployment Shit. and half of them were in our company. And I remember our battalion there, there was like four day stretch. We lost four guys. It was like back to back to back to back to back. Mm-hmm. And it, it was nonstop all over the AO people popping off and, you just kept hearing Kazavak, Angel, Kazavak, this, that, um, you know, reading off their, their, we call them the kill cards, which is, you know, your last name. Right. And then your last four or your zap number. I don't know what you guys would call that. 
probably the same thing okay um so yeah like if you get like golf or golf company hotel okay the last name begins with an h who in the platoon has an h you know and then you start like thinking you know, who the fuck got hit and you you wouldn't know until you got back because you're not just gonna say the name over the radio you know right but it was it was fucked uh like we were on a patrol and there's this this guy shimmel um he was this weird little kid really fucking weird yeah. but he would give you the shirt off his back and in fact as i was going on a patrol i smoked marble 27s at this point um those are the jam back in the day yeah i mean i only quit like last year two years Good ago for you man a year and a half good choice yeah yeah i mean the i it's it's great being able to fucking breathe again <laughs> like it <laughs> you don't realize it until and, you're done smoking though. and even exercising man like it, it makes everything so much better right. anyway so i'm smoking 27s he's got one more 27 and i had ran out and i didn't even know i just walked up i'm like hey shimmy you got a cigarette I, I just ran out i'm about to go on patrol i want to fucking smoke he's like yeah man opens it up takes out crumples a pack i'm like what are you talking about dude he's like no no He's like, go ahead and take it. I'm like, I'm not taking your fucking lucky, dude. Yeah. So we go out on patrol. You know, he convinced me. He's like, no, he's like, please take it. I'm, I'm going to be getting a package soon, whatever. We got on patrol. Um, I remember we were set up in like a site, like a makeshift hide site. And we were just, you know, observing the area along a canal. And then you hear some pop shots in the distance. And we're like, ah, it's too far away. Nothing's really going on. And we get radio chatter. Um, the person running the patrol was getting yelled at by our company commander like you you need to get back here lieutenant because you know are you aware that one of your marines was shot inside the base blah 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 and we're like who the fuck got hit so we're going back going back and by the time we get back um they already had the the fucking medevac set up and they had the area cordon off and i look and it's fucking shimmel shit dude you got a round from a firefight like two fucking clicks away went up in the fucking air and came directly down on the, on the fucking rack and blew his fucking head off. What the fuck? Yeah, the like one in a million shot, just fucking boom. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was fucked walking back in and I got screamed at because I just, I that was, I lost my composure. Like I, I stopped and I walked up to him as he was getting worked on on the ground and I was just looking and I just remember hearing, Hamel, Hamel. Man, we'll get the fuck inside. So I get inside and I go over and the, this, you know, I touched his, his brain and I was like, oh my fucking God, you know, and I got sick to my fucking stomach and, you know, I, I immediately thought about he had this fucking K bar that he slept with. You know, we all got issued K bar, but he slept religiously with his own personal K bar. So I, I immediately grabbed that and put it in my pack because I didn't want that getting put into like supply. Like the, right. that was his fucking K bar. Right. When we get back to the States, I eventually was able to give it to his parents, which made me happy. Um, but I, I knew that was his most prized, prized possession. So I, I kept that. Um, then uh, the day that really, really changed a lot of shit for me was um, the day my team leader got shot. So there was another squad that was kind of running like a satellite patrol, which is a patrol that's adjacent to ours, kind of in the same direction, but it makes it look like our force is bigger than it is. It's it's a kind of a deception tactic. Right. So we're we're you know putting along, doing our standard thing again, and uh, the other squad gets contact. So we move to intercept. We're moving up to a point where we think we're going to flank the guys uh, as they egress out of the area. So we set up along a canal. And I'm I'm a saw gunner, so I'm I'm set up. And then my team leader Chuck looks at me. He's like, "Hey Hamill, I need you to scoot over one, like go over to the next tree and and set up and aim this direction." I was like, "Roger that." So I move over. About ten seconds later, a fucking PKM burst goes, zips and fucking hits him in the leg right where I was. Like he took my spot and he got. Damn, dude. So the fucking one round hit hit his shin and it shattered and blew out the back of his calf. Um. So he starts fucking screaming and like we were like, oh shit. So we hop in the canal. Um, a whole bunch of guys grab him, get him in the canal. 
um, we're starting to drag up on the other side of the canal and our, our doc, um, Doc Hicks got him up over the canal and everything like that with the help of a couple of guys in the squad starts working on him. Then psh, we start getting shot at again from that side. So it was like, fuck. <laughs> so we pull him into the canal. I distinctly remember uh, Doc like putting his fucking finger in the bullet hole to stop it while he was getting his shit out. Yeah. Um, and I just remember looking down. And this is one of the like back then we didn't we weren't allowed to record a lot of shit we we would get our asses ripped apart if we got caught right. someone had a helmet cam there and that was one of the things i'm f- truly grateful for because i i listened to it a lot over the years um because i was the only uh saw gunner in the vicinity shooting at certain point i could tell how i could tell it was me shooting i remember that day it's imprinted right. on my mind so I, like i hear the bursts and everything like that <clears throat> but just listening to the video and like all the chaos and everything and everybody shooting and all the snaps and uh and just reliving that and in that moment i was like fuck this is exactly what i got yelled at for this is exactly what i got trained for like i'm in charge now yeah. and i need to fucking step up so i i like started to freeze and shit and this is this is where and i don't know if you ever i don't know if i ever really told him this but this is where Leo, the guy that I mentioned before, um, he really stood out to me and like he he helped me. Um, I kind of started to like, I was like, okay, okay, like what do I what do I fucking do? And Leo's like, hey, hey, Hamill, like tell your guys this this that that and the other thing, like go over here, set up here. And I was like, no, our, no, hey, I got it. Like he kind of like snapped me out of it a little yeah. bit because I started to get a little bit dazed and I wasn't. I wasn't thinking as a team leader. I was still thinking as a saw gunner. Right. So I was just shooting at the cyclic rate. I was shooting like damn near anything yeah. that I could fucking train on. And um, <laughs> we we eventually got, you know, contact with uh, our company headquarters and everything. Got a bird spun up, got some gunships on the way. Um, you know, we popped smoke out in the open field. And we we had been getting hit from three sides at this point, um, and we, we, luckily we had the canal, so we were pretty safe in there. Like we we weren't out out in the open and exposed as much. Um, but the Kazavak bird landed directly in front of one of the positions we were getting shot at from, mm. unknowingly. So I remember there was six guys dropped all their weapons. And just picked Leak up, Chuck, and uh, the team leader. Yeah, and just started running without their weapons across this open fucking field, which, mind you, also had knee high mud because it had been raining the night before. So they're fucking slogging along and shit. I'm like, fuck, they are totally exposed. And there's a huge target, a huge helicopter out there. So myself and another guy start running out and shit, and uh. We're shooting, we're engaging and moving, and then I see this guy, uh, I, I distinctly remember calling out a guy in this like little hay silo uh, directly over the helicopter, and um, he poked out with what I thought was a weapon, and I just started pff, laying bursts at the window and shit, and every five seconds after that, that I you know would go back to that window and dump some rounds into it, just to make sure that I'd gotten whoever the fuck it was and to make sure that there was no, you know, no chance of any of the guys getting shot. And uh, the guy with me did the same. And uh, I think it was like the gunner or something hopped out and started shooting at something with his pistol too. It was, it's kind of funny looking back at it now. Um, like every, Is that protocol for them to drop their weapons on? I mean, that doesn't sound... No. Uh. You're supposed to sling it on your back. Right. But the conditions... Like they needed all, they needed to be as light as possible. Yeah. So six men dropped any way of defending themselves to bring Chuck to the fucking helicopter, which was like a hundred meters away. It was, it was fucking nuts. Yeah. And with no way for you guys to even really pull security, it'd be kind of hard because they have a bird in the way, you know, you can't, you'll be taking like crossfire. That's a, you know? Exactly. And it takes a lot of, you can't really, so, I mean, that was, we had to be very precise with our shots as we were moving with them. Mm-hmm. And as we're moving out, the rest of the guys in the canal that are, you know, behind, staying behind, they lose, you know, fields of fire because we're entering their fields of fire. So it kind of restricts everything. Everything turns into a, 
like a kind of a fucking mess if you're not they're careful. Clusterfuck. Yeah, I mean, and that's uh, that's one of the things that we get trained on day one. Like, it's, it's nailed into your fucking head to watch your fields of fire, you know, your weapons conditions and all that shit. Yeah. So we get Chuck on the bird. I remember taking a knee because I was so fucking exhausted and just looking back and, you know, I kept shooting at, you know, the little alcoves and just, I, I was just, at this point for me, I was covering fire covering fire so the guys get back and then i hear ham will move and i I turn around i start running and everybody was already in the canal so um they get in the canal i remember it felt like my mouth like even as i'm talking about it right now i remember it it felt like uh i had been chewing on cotton balls yeah and like my my adrenaline just dumped my body crashed all 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 the fucking energy that i had all the fight that had just you know flooded my body has, was now leaving and I was crashing and uh, I guess I was having like a severe chemical dump or something like that an adrenal dump or whatever yeah and uh, at this point there was a fucking Huey and a Cobra so it just just hellfire rockets and shit and that's another video that I love watching and the, the, we were cheering like we were just fucking screaming because we were so happy I bet man and uh, they did their thing and that walk back to the base was eerily quiet like there was no noise anywhere no no animals like you occasionally you would hear like wildlife um you would see locals walking around some kids there was no no one was near us no one said anything everything was just still and we get back i had to borrow a magazine from from fucking leo because i had ran out of ammo huh. and uh so i got an ammo or a magazine in my fucking saw in the magazine well and uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh we're 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 walking back and everything and we, we get inside the wire and i just remember walking in and like the entire platoon was just like this they like they their jaws were were dropped and they were like oh fuck you know like they, they saw us walking in yeah and they, they saw how bad we got fucked up and everything. And we had to go do a, a debrief with uh, the platoon commander and the platoon sergeant and everything. And I remember just sitting in the room and um, looking down at my saw. And, like, I was kind of in the back middle of the room and everything like that. And, you know, everyone was piled in. And I just remember everything just went off, like all, all noise and everything. And uh, then I heard Hamill. Hamel, Hamel, I turn and look, and everyone in the room is staring at me. Yeah. And uh, I forget who said it, but someone was like, "You did a you did a good job out there." And I was just like, "How the fuck did I do a good job? What? Like Chuck's gone. Like we, I, we, at this point, is he gonna survive? Like is he okay? I don't fucking know. These are all the thoughts going through my head, and like this guy was my team leader, and I was." taking in the entire situation and everything was like fucking hitting me like a ton of bricks like i'm in charge of the fucking fire team now i'm the saw gunner as well is chuck okay like how you know, how is this going to work from here on out you know you get that close to getting fucking killed and it's going to make you a little bit more hesitant the next time you go out on patrol definitely <clears throat> so it uh I remember our squad leader who's a sergeant at the time but uh, made it to the staff sergeant he was one of the, the raiders that died in that, that helicopter crash in 2015 off the coast of Florida Yeah, he was on that he went to uh, he went to Marsoc after that deployment but I remember um, I, the platoon commander and the platoon sergeant were they were i think we were getting ready for the next patrol and everything like that and they're asking like ham well you good to go like you you ready for this you good and i remember flynn looked at me and he's just, he's just straight off the boat from ireland right. he, you know he, he could he could piss on you and tell you it was raining and you'd fucking believe him like he was he was smooth <laughs> like he, he was he got meritoriously promoted like all the way up that's from awesome. he was he was the shit like he was good at his job he was amazing at his job and everyone fucking loved him. 
even if you hated him, you loved him. Like Irish he, charm. Yeah, he was good. So I remember he looked at me, and it, and I I didn't even know what to answer. I was like, "Am I ready?" I'm thinking, and I I almost said yes, just just to say yes. I remember he looked at me and he like winked at me, and he smiled and he's like he's like, "Yeah, I th- I think Hamill's doing a fine a fine job," and uh, that just made me go like, "Okay, I can do this. I got this." And from that point on, for the rest of the deployment, I just I kept moving. I kept shooting. We kept losing guys. You know, we kept getting ambushed and blown up. And um, there, there was a, one fucking huge operation we did. And myself and another guy got RPG'd four times on the fucking road um, as we were covering for this this uh, vehicle section to get back into the compound. Um that's that's a whole long fucking story and then I I'm not even going to get into that was a big fucking shit show. Um but needless to say this is basically this is the theme, you know, for that whole deployment. And I, that deployment completely fucked me mentally in I a bet. lot of ways. Sure, I bet, man. Like it, it it like it made me feel invincible. It made me you know, not appreciate life. It made me very reckless but then you also have the you know the part and parcel the ptsd uh the depression the anxiety um i barely slept when i i I mean still to this day i barely sleep it's it's very it's very hard for me to get quality sleep but that's also with all the shit that i got going on too that's more of i'm just a busy motherfucker now um but it's just coming back and after that deployment and just looking at my then wife and i was just like this is what what is this life what is this back here yeah. like it, and it's kind of what we were talking about before like nothing changes back home yeah. so that just like compounds everything and then you come home on leave and everyone is afraid to talk to you because they know you went through some fucking shit yeah and it just doesn't help and they can't understand and you can't possibly fucking translate it to them because they weren't there. And then that's where a lot of the breakdown of communication happens when it comes to relationships, when it comes to friendships, when it comes to family. That's a big fucking problem for a lot of us. And that's that's something that I don't think guys realize until after it's happening or it's happened. I only just realized it, you know last year. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and I there was a buddy that I uh, I grew up with that was a uh, special operations. And one of the things that he um, was talking about, like he was going through some issues with uh, his uh, family life. And um, I was thinking about it and I was like, you know, how crazy would that be? Like, I luckily didn't have to deploy to Afghanistan or Iraq, which I got out in 03 and I got lucky that I didn't have to go. I got medically discharged, but I never had to deploy. I wanted to deploy. It just didn't work out in my favor. And maybe that's a good thing. Um, yeah, because I saw guys that were coming back and like they're having like marital issues, and it's like, how, <laughs> like you 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 just almost got killed, and now like your wife or significant other is like arguing with you about not taking the trash out or something mm-hmm. so like insignificant in the big scheme of things. It's like how do you process that shit, you know? And um, I can see <laughs> that being a huge, huge struggle for a lot of you guys, dude. Yeah, that's when you're married to someone that can't possibly understand that it it takes an extremely special person to be able to deal with that and be able to understand and be able to take a step back and realize that, you know, that person has gone through a lot of trauma, a lot of shit. It takes a lot of maturity on the other person's part to recognize that and understand that. And obviously at a, at such a young age, like at this point coming back from 2009, I, I, I had just became legal to drink. Like it was, I, I was still a fucking kid. Yeah. Um, and my second child had been born while I was on deployment. So, so you missed the birth of both of your kids, huh? All three. Wow. Oh, you have three kids. Yeah. Wow, man. Yeah. But the third one I was back here for, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain that later. Yeah. Um, so I'm back here and I'm Where are you like stationed by the way, Camp Lejeune point. okay, in North Carolina. Okay. Uh, I was with two eight my whole career and I was in 2006 to 2012, but I'm back 
going about my business, you know, life kind of gets to a normality, I guess you could say, right. like I'd acclimated back here. Um, I was walking around with a huge chip on my shoulder and I thought I was shit hot. Uh, everything that I had done on deployment, everything that I'd fucking been through, all the guys that we lost, like it was, it's a recipe for disaster, reckless behavior. Um, just, you know, turned to alcohol, started drinking yeah. and all of us did it. So everyone thought it was normal. Right. We weren't like standing out from each other. Like everyone was drinking, binge drinking to excess. Um, and obviously you're still active duty. So you're not really addressing your PTSD. You're not addressing, you know, why you're not sleeping at night. You're not understanding it. You think, oh, this is whatever. I'm just fucking tired. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm hyper vigilant now. Like, okay, that happens when you get shot at and blown up, like whatever. You don't realize that these are all symptoms that are affecting every fiber of your being yep. and every relationship you're in and every i mean everything <laughs> yeah i mean well with my first marriage uh we if you fast forward to so my third deployment when i got injured and everything like that she was cheating on me all three deployments and i was not the wiser so she left me a walter reed i found out because my uh my triple amputee buddy comes up in his electric wheelchair with my room key and he's like hey don't shoot the messenger i'm like what are you talking about he's like your, your wife just, you know, handed me this key card and said she was going back to Jersey with the kids. I was like, oh, that's great. You know, I'm going to go out now. I'm going to fucking party. Wow, dude. Yeah, I mean, it was at the time I was like, fuck you, bitch. Like, I, I didn't. I, I mean, that's know. that's wild. <laughs> no, it's it's actually not. It's actually extremely common there. That's the thing. Like, uh, the, you saw guys just get fucking dumped at the hospital. You know, wives would just leave. They you, They can't take it there. There's a lot of wives that stuck it out, and to this day, they're still with their men or women, respectively. There are a few women there um, that their husbands stood by their side. But it was like, it was very, very common for your significant other to say, I can't do this, and just bounce. Um, it's, like, it's like almost like it feels like kicking somebody when they're down, though. It's like you're down and out, and it's like. <laughs> You well, know what? Just to top to put a little, you know, cherry on top for you. I'm leaving. It's like, what the fuck, dude? What kind of human does that, dude? <laughs> Lots of humans. <laughs> fuck, man. Um, it's dirty. But like, it was it was rough there. Um, but you know, so let me let me go back a little bit. Like at, at this point, I had come back from the deployment, from my second deployment. And I was getting close to getting out. I was getting close to my four year mark and I had no job opportunities as Marine Corps infantry back home in New Jersey. Yeah. Like I, I was just, I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to, my job skills wouldn't really translate immediately. Um, so I said, fuck it. I'm going to reenlist on a reenlist for like $5,000 before taxes, some absurd amount. All right. So you get about 2000 of that. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was so dumb, I, I, but I wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing it for revenge. Yeah. And that's never why you want to do anything, which I've learned. Um, so we go on this deployment. Uh, the whole workup, I'm like harping to my guys about uh, the essential need to understand your team leader's job because your team leader could get fucking hurt and this and that. And this happened on my deployment. And I yeah. said it to them so many fucking times. I saw them getting sick of it. Yeah. Like I knew, I knew that they were getting sick of me fucking telling them this shit. I was getting sick of saying it, but I just kept harping on it, and repeating it. And looking back on it now, that's that's because I was so traumatized by that moment that I just kept bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up. It was kind of like my mind saying, you need to fucking address this. Yeah. And the only way I knew to do that was just to interpret the experience and share it with my guys so that if something were to happen, they would know what to do. And unfortunately the opportunity presented itself a month into the third deployment um we get word on the grounds from a local national that there was an improvised explosive device in a compound um about 50 meters away from us so i looked at my my buddy john uh he was the squad leader i was the first fire team leader so i was the second in command on the, on the patrol and i look at him and he's like you want to go get into get into some trouble it's like fuck yeah let's do it so we we shoot down um we find the compound and we set up security and i remember taking the minesweeper off my point man's back who was also my saw gunner um 
and he's he set up security and everything like that and he kind of protested at first he wanted to go in um but i told him no it's it's cool man just you know set up your saw aim this way i'll be right back so i, I remember turning around looking at john and um there was another john there was another team leader and gary and saying hey guys see you on the other side jokingly all right so i go in i get about three quarters of the compound swept and um I stepped over the the pressure plate a couple a couple times at this point, and I, I had no idea. So I went out alongside the wall, and I remember finding the hoax IED, which was just a metal tube wrapped up. I remember there was no wires, so I, I kind of like a dumbass pulled it out, and I was holding it, and uh, I remember coming back through the doorway on the backside of the compound, and I raised it up, and I remember. I was going to show John, uh, and I shouted, Hey John. And as I did that, I stepped down on my right foot and I remember the ground sinking and everything froze. And I was just like, fuck. Cause I knew I had just stepped on a fucking pressure plate. Like it was so fucking obvious the ground sunk and then poof, launched the improvised explosive device was five feet behind me, launched me about 10 feet in the air. I landed on the back of my neck. Um, and I knew I had gotten blown up because I couldn't breathe. The oxygen got ripped out of my lungs. Um, I immediately grabbed my weapon and brought it up to the ready um, as I'm on my back, just waiting to get shot at. I didn't really remember that I was in a compound, so there, I really couldn't have gotten shot at. Right. Um, luckily, there was no roof on the compound. Otherwise, I probably would have been eviscerated, like yeah. it just bouncing the energy all over and everything. Um, so you don't you don't have EOD with you or, or anything? You're just no, by yourself? on this deployment we didn't we needed to justify bringing them out. So that's kind of why I was looking for the IED. We right. needed to find evidence in order to call them out. Um. So then I remember going for my tourniquet just based off muscle memory, which was in my right cargo pocket, but that was blown off. Um. I pulled my stump up to my chest to try and like just the medical training that I received. Uh, and all all the workups and everything like that i knew i had to get it above my heart but it had been cauterized so i was fine anyway uh, my guys got up to me i remember hearing the like the thuds um as they were getting closer to me because my i my hearing was still fucked like it was ringing um i couldn't breathe everything was gray like there was there was the dust and everything but like i wasn't seeing in color i think my my retinas or something had been shocked Everything was like grayscale. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> they uh, they started working on me. And I remember the first tourniquet snapped. And then they put um, another tourniquet on me. Finally got that cranked down. Um, the first question I asked, though, and this is no bullshit. I looked at the doc and I said, hey, doc, I know my leg's gone, which when you're working on a, a casualty, the one thing you don't do is tell the casualty, yeah, this is wrong with you. Like, because they can go into shock and everything like that. Yeah. But I was coherent enough. I knew my body was going into shock. I felt it going into shock. I was like, okay, this is happening right now. This is what's going on. Okay. My leg's gone. Like my kneecap was there hanging on by some sinew. I'm like, my leg is gone. Okay. What next? Um, and I look at him. I'm like, doc, I know my leg's gone but please tell me my dick still are. <laughs> well, dude, first off, that's gnarly. Second off, I think a lot of guys, I mean, a lot I mean, of guys do ask that. Do they really? A lot of guys Holy ask that. Shit. A lot of guys, I've, I've, I've shared this story wow. with a lot of fucking amputees. They're like, oh my God, me too. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's all you care about. <laughs> right. Fuck everything else. Uh, please tell guy, me I still dude. got my dick, you know? <laughs> we got my dick, we're all good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, take my legs, just don't take my dick. <laughs> Fuck, man. So my buddy wound up his fist and he's like, hold on. And he kind of like, boom, punched me right in the dick. And I was like, oh my fucking God, it hurts so bad. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you still got it. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. We're good. Yeah. Um, so they, they got some bandages on me and everything. Um, the whole backside of my calf, my thigh, my ass had been blown apart like a banana peel. Mm -hmm. So they bandaged me up as best they could. Um, get me outside. Lean me up against the wall. I'm like, someone give me a fucking cigarette. Remember three cigarettes got shoved in my face. I think I picked the Marlboro Red and I just started smoking it. 
And I was just sitting here like this with it dangling out of my mouth. And I remember thinking, oh, this is making me sick. So I just kind of like, like spit it out. And then I just closed my eyes. And I was just, you know, kind of relaxing and not really thinking about anything. And all of a sudden I get a fucking sternum rub. Like, Corporal Ebel, wake up. And I'm like, I'm fine. Like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, the, the the dude was right. Like right. He, he was making sure I was okay, and I don't I don't fault him for it at all. But fuck, sternum rubs hurt. Yeah. So he uh, <laughs> did that, and and I just remember taking in everything around me. Like, are you in pain at this point? Are you like hurting? Or are you? Um, no, actually, it really wasn't that painful at that point because I had already been hit with a couple times of morphine, the fentanyl lollipop. I was like, yeah. I was fucking numb. Um. I felt the pain, but I didn't feel the pain. Got it. You know, my body's natural um, pain, whatever the fuck. I don't know. The pain management was working in conjunction with all the fucking opioids in my system. Right. So I was just like, okay, this sucks. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. um, I get on the bird and I remember looking out the back of the bird and just seeing my squad get smaller and smaller until they look like ants and just my heart plummeted. Like, I felt like my heart stayed on the ground and I was so, I felt like I failed. I'd let my guys down. I I failed the mission. They were down a man. Like, they, they were down knowledge, experience, you know, a, a fucking weapon. And it's my fucking fault. And it, it's a whole bunch of self-doubt just started hitting me like tidal waves. Remember the guy, he leaned over me, asked my last four, my last name. I gave it to him. He's like, you're going to go to sleep now. I'm like, okay, whatever. Yeah. And then um, that's when I flatlined for two minutes. It was because of the blood loss and the, the drugs had lowered my heart rate to a certain point. And <clears throat> I, I try to, I try to explain I, I, I'm very okay with talking about this. Yeah. I try to explain it to people the best I can, but words fail me every time. It's, yeah, you have to experience it yourself in order to even understand anything. It's, um, I think there's a quote about that. I think Stephen King, uh, I mean, hate him or love him, but he has a quote that says, uh, the most important things are the hardest to say because words diminish them. Yeah. And that's pretty much true, man. It was, uh, it was very uh, quiet. It was, it was peaceful in a sense. Um, anything you worry about, um, I talk about this a lot. Anything you worry about, like in your day-to-day -day life, um, bills, responsibilities, <sighs> fucking traffic, going to work, all that bullshit, it just... It evaporates. It's gone. Becomes insignificant completely. And it's... It's... it's. <laughs> I don't want to say it's the best feeling I've ever had. It's because it's a lack of feeling. But it's like... Man, it, it, was, it was insane having nothing in my mind. This is when you flatlined? Yeah. It was... Just, it, and it was... There was some kind of... I don't. I don't know how to. Think. It, like, Are you religious? Uh, I'm not now. No, I'm really not. Even after that experience, like that didn't. No, no. And I, if I'm gonna, I, I think the Buddhists have something going on with yeah. what they're talking about, like energy transference of matter, that kind of bullshit, reincarnation. Yeah. That's kind of more my shtick. That's kind of what I think makes the most sense based off of what I felt and what I saw. Interesting. And. That doesn't mean I'm, I don't practice Buddhism or anything like that shit. I don't even know that much about it. It's just right. based off the little bit of knowledge that I have about the world's religions. I think they're kind of in the right frame of mind. Right. Um, I don't. Yeah. Religion to me is it's like a man-made construct. I think I tend to think more of like a scientific thing. Yeah. Like if you want if you want religion in your life and you choose to be religious, I don't care what your religion is. I don't care if you worship the fucking flying spaghetti monster right cool dude i don't care yeah it's for not sure. uh, like if you want to do that you can do that whatever makes you happy great it's probably one of my most fascinating like things that i like to talk about because i feel like i i feel like i'm on a 
I'm learning something from people when we talk about it, Mm -hmm. um, about religion and stuff, because it's something that people get so passionate about and they get so fired up about if if they're like religious, they get super like amped up about it. Yeah. And I think that's totally awesome. But for a long time, I I would get angry about it. I'd be like, because I grew up like with religion and when I got older, I was like, no, this is bullshit. And it was, it was done all wrong and, and this and that. And when I was a kid, um, I don't know how long I flatlined for, but I drowned, didn't have any heart rate, wasn't breathing, seizures from lack of oxygen in my brain, inside of my mouth was all chewed up. And um, and I used to always tell people, like, well, if religion is, if what you're telling me is true, I would remember something. Even though I was a kid, I would remember something mm-hmm. that would be so significant that, like, there could be no other option for me. Like, that, that would be it. Um, and so I, I think I... I definitely ascribe to kind of where you're at with the whole, like if I'm made up of matter and energy, like when I leave this physical universe, Mm -hmm. that energy has to go somewhere. Yeah. It can't just disappear into nothingness. So it's like, it goes somewhere. Where does it go? Your guess is as good as mine, buddy. (laughs) I I have no clue. There's so much we, we don't fucking know about ourselves or about the universe as is. But talking to guys like you, I think it is kind of, you've been there, you've seen the other side and it's like, well, what was it? And you're like, it was just an absence of feeling but that's the thing too is like it was everything and it was nothing it was it was it's it it really sounds fucking insane and that's that's part of the reason that i have a hard time putting putting it to words and especially like i can't i can't talk about that with a lot of people you know there's there's a few people that i trust that i talk to or if i'm sharing my story I'll, i'll try to talk about it but like just random Joe Schmo on the fucking street and they ask me questions about it, which I will happily engage in conversation about it. Um, I, I don't want to fucking come off as crazy or anything like that. And anytime that I have broached that subject, it's like, Oh, yo, w- did you see, you know, was there white, white light? And <laughs> did you hear a voice and Jesus and this? And that? I'm like, no guys, like, <laughs> yeah, it's not like that. Like everyone, everyone, has this image in their mind of the afterlife and all that shit. And it's just, for me, it was, it was like I had relived in an instant, every instant of my life. Like your life really does replay. Yeah. And it seems like this large amount of time, but then it's not, that's why it's, I, I, I say it sounds so fucking trippy and you know what really fucking tripped me out after I got, back in uh, interstellar have you seen that i have not with matthew mcconaughey you no, gotta check that out it. i love it's matthew like, mcconaughey it's like a time space kind of it. it's like a time space kind of thing they're they're searching for another planet because earth is dying right and it winds up being like it, it turns into the end i don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen yeah, it i haven't it, seen it so don't tell me it's <laughs> dude i i stood up and i was like oh my fucking god because that that was like probably the the closest description of like anything I had experienced. And uh, I, it was, it tripped me the fuck out. Um, that inception inception tripped me out too. Yeah. My buddy had me <laughs> uh, read a book and I forget what it, it's probably on my phone, but I don't feel like getting it out and finding it, but there was a book about the afterlife and he, um, he wanted me to read it. I think as a way to like, he felt like it was his duty to make sure that this, uh, you know, agnostic guy or whatever you want to call me, um, doesn't go to hell. And so he wanted me to read this and, and prove to me that there was an afterlife with God and this and that. And it's like the, all these stories of people who have uh, near death experiences. And, um, I couldn't help, but think like, I don't know, you gotta, re- you gotta consider the source. And so it's like, when you're hearing all these stories of people who have near death, near death experiences, although they may be ver- very real, f- real for those people. Um, I think that there's a lot of programming that goes into that. It's yep. like you have a, a picture. Yeah, you have a picture of like what God looks like. It's what you grow up with re- with religion or programming and this and that. So it's like, yeah. So when you have a near the near death experience, I can't even say it properly. Um, it's uh, it's what you've kind of been taught, I guess, if that makes any sense. But that's the thing, man. Is I I have been raised in an Irish Catholic family, right? My entire life, I, it wasn't I, that way. For like you. I got baptized. I went through fucking. All, the whole fucking nine communion all that shit uh. so then maybe like that's even the bigger question is like so who's writing these books and what agenda are they trying to that's make? what i was saying before religion <laughs> right. is a man-made thing right. and it's just so i mean it's yeah. it is what it is man like it, it, everything 
whatever whatever floats your fucking boat that's that's all totally, i say man. but like i i can only person and I, that's another thing too is i can't i can't speak on another person's experience experience will always vary like everyone's gonna have their own unique perspective on things when it comes to feelings or you know what they see with that's with anything in life too so it's that's another thing that i had to learn was just because someone hasn't been through what i've been through or experienced what i've experienced it doesn't make them any less of a person than me i struggled with that a lot man um and we talked about it earlier that my mindset of like just kind of like okay if you don't want to drink just then just don't fucking drink yeah. if you don't want to take opiates and you don't want to be on just pain don't pills, do it. just don't do it yeah um but i struggled with judgment of people who weren't doing it that way where it's yeah. like they need the groups so they need um the support or the comfort of like having people there to like kind of coax them and help them yeah and i just wasn't that way so i had a hard time understanding that people i don't know i just had a hard time with not people just not grasping the mindset of like just don't do it just make it and maybe that's just me being an extremist uh maybe even a, a judgmental asshole but no um I, it, was, it was definitely a struggle man and i i can see for a guy like you like with your experience and then coming back to your hometown or even coming back to the unit and guys that haven't experienced that or people that you grew up with haven't experienced what you have it would be i feel like it would be super fucking hard to relate man mm -hmm. super hard it is so and that's that's why I, I lost a lot of relationships and a lot of friendships um do you blame yourself for that do you think it was a healthy it is uh, absolutely part partly my fault i mean it's it's on like other parties it's you know they don't understand and that's <clears throat> again like it takes a special person to, to be able to understand that but it is also me and how i was you know composing myself and how i was handling everything and you know what i was doing and i wasn't nurturing anything it was all i was very self-centered very egotistical um i didn't really concern myself with anyone else everyone else as far as i was concerned could kick rocks like they, they hadn't been through what i've been through right and I had, I put myself on a pedestal and I thought I was better than a lot of people for the longest time. Yeah. Um, it took a lot of training and a lot of like self-evaluation and a lot of mistakes in order to figure out and humble myself to the point where, you know, and, and I, I can't tell you how much stress has like been stripped of me just because I, I try to every single day exercise humility in everything that I do. Um, and I, I try so, so fucking bad to just be a normal fucking person. You know, like okay. I know that I've been through a lot of shit. I'm very proud of myself for everything that I've been through. I would go through everything again. Yeah. I would go through my second divorce again. Like I would, I would go through all my failed relationships again, all my friendships that I've lost, all the mistakes that I've made because I'm here now sitting in this room talking to you. Yeah. I'm able to share my story and I'm I'm fairly certain one person can hear this and it it could it could change their life. It could help them. If they're sitting, you know, in a position where they're they want to fucking end it all, just like I was at one point. Um that that was another thing. That, when did you get to that point? That's I mean that's another That was right after point. right after my injury. Um I had come home and it was um it was in, in 2012, I was sitting outside a marsh in Atlantic City. Um, it was by my dad's house and I had my 40 in my lap and I just, I wanted, I wanted to end it all. And uh, I was, I was just very, very tired of, you know, dealing with the demons and all the struggles. Um, I still at this point hadn't been diagnosed with PTSD. I refused to go and get any kind of, you know, mental treatment with anything. So you're not taking any medication at this point or anything? Nope. Uh -huh. I had completely, three months after I got my leg blown off, I flushed all my meds down the toilet. I was on 16 different types of medications and I just flushed them. And I, my body went through severe withdrawals and everything and I had to go to the ER and get morphine injections and I spent the night in the ER a couple nights in a row. But after that, boom. 
cold turkey and i was done you and me both brother yeah sometimes i feel like that's the way to go i mean i'm not uh, just that's what i did with smoking too i quit a cold <laughs> turkey it was, I, I relapsed with the smoking that yeah. was the hardest thing uh, but i've also heard quitting cigarettes is actually harder than quitting heroin <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't know what's harder i think it's all hard like equally hard it all sucks but i think that i mean i never uh, i had somebody actually reach out to me on social media um on saturday saturday or sunday and uh she was going through some serious like uh, benzodiazepine withdrawals. So she was trying to quit benzos and she'd been on them for a while and she couldn't find uh, every time she would try to stop, she would feel absolutely terrible. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like your brain is, is fucked. You know what I mean? Like you've been on this shit for, for years and now you're trying to come off of it. Um, I'm not going to advise you cause I'm not a doctor, but I'm just going to tell you that like for me, what worked for me is getting to a point where I was willing to die in order to quit. Mm -hmm. And that's the message that I try to put out to people. Like, listen, I, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not advising you to do anything the way that I do. Cause like, like I said, I had three, you know, blackout seizures from coming off all my shit cold Turkey. But I knew that I was ready when I was willing to die to be done. Yeah. Cause I had tried nine times before that to get off of all of my opiates and the methadone, the fentanyl, um, the Oxycontin, the Clonopin, like everything that I was on, sleeping pills, everything, yeah. I needed to be done. And I think it, I got to a point where like I got a divorce and I had my son and I'm like, yeah. fuck, dude, I need to reevaluate my life. And um, so, yeah, at that point I was like, all right, well, I'm willing to die to be done. And my grandma was super upset with me because she was like, you know, you could die, you know, if you you know come off this stuff, it's stupid. I was like, well, actually, you have a son. Like, that's irresponsible of you. And maybe she was right, but I told her, I was like, well, if I do die doing this, at least I'll <clears> die. <throat> at least I'll die. And he'll know that I was doing something admirable. Yeah. You know, that I was doing something that to you be were a more to present I father, you. you know? Yeah. Um. So back to you, you're, you're sitting there in uh, Atlantic City and you have your 40 and what stopped you? My kids. Um. At that point, I only had the two children and... um literally about to do it and they popped in my head and I just started crying like everything hit me like a tidal wave I was at that moment I was drowning I felt like I was drowning and I was completely depressed and everything just seemed to be crushing me I wanted everything to fucking stop and I almost stopped it but my kids popped in my head and I was like what the fuck am I doing so I, I drove back, I locked it up and I just, you know, woke up the next day and I, I don't even remember the next day that well, but I just, I, I remember that I, I just went about my business, did my thing, yeah. pretended that nothing had happened and, you know, ignored, Hey, that's a huge red flag guy. Like, you did know, you like, talk to anybody about it or no, not, not for a while. Wow. That was, my, that was me, myself and I, I remember I kind of started to broach the subject with my dad. I tried to like tiptoe around the subject. Yeah. Like, hey, dad, when you were in, did you ever, you know, get to the point where, you know, you were struggling with stuff? He's like, no, no. I was like, okay. I'm like, you know, there's there's a lot of guys fucking killing themselves and everything. And he's like, if you kill yourself, you're a fucking pussy. Uh, and I was like, <laughs> thanks, Pop. I was like, that didn't really sit well with me, but I was like, okay, he's right. Whatever, you know. Um, yeah, we, uh, I don't talk to my dad anymore. I don't, I don't talk to any of my family really. I, I talked to my mom here not too long ago because my grandma died and she was out in Seattle. So I, I flew out there and did what I thought was right and kind of reinitiated contact and everything. And are you happy about that? I could care less now at this point. I mean, it's, so, that's that's just my personal feeling. And like, there's a whole bunch of other bullshit and drama. Like my little brother joined after I got my leg blown off and pulled some fucking shit, like some stolen Valor shit and right. bought, went and bought a purple heart. And I was, I was just, I, I'm, I don't like my family at all. Yeah. Like it, it's a, there's a whole bucket of issues that I have and they just compound it exponentially. So I just, I tend to, I just, I, this, I'm very centered on my family. You know what's funny, man, is everybody that I've um, interviewed on this podcast, like when I reached out to you on social media, I hadn't met you before. Yeah. We'd never talked on the phone or anything like that. And I always find it like fascinating 
that even though we we come from completely different backgrounds, completely different states, we were in different branches of service, you were deployed, I wasn't, there's so many commonalities between mm-hmm. myself and a lot of the people that I have in this podcast. Yeah. And it's not planned. It's not like I'm looking for people to have no, a similar no, story. No, I noticed like, that too when I listened to your podcast. It's, I, it's, I had noticed it. It's, um, it's amazing to me. It's astonishing. I'm like, yeah. dude, this is so crazy. Like, I don't talk to my mom. I barely talk to my father. You yeah. know, I don't talk to my brother, my sister. And... Well, they also, a lot of them can't get it. They can't understand it. And that's not their fault. Uh, You know, like I said before, but it's still a a matter of fact is they, they can't comprehend. And that just naturally kind of drifts apart a lot of times. Yeah. You know, but, but, you know, also in my case, there was a lot of shit that, um, catalyzed me cutting ties with them, um, up to the point where my dad actually coordinated with my second ex-wife so that I wasn't there when my youngest was born. Mm. And it was, and I was, I was also drinking heavily. So like I, I, I had this, I couldn't give a fuck less about anybody else, you know? And, and then I saw like this, and this is the thing. My second ex-wife uh, sent me like screenshots or something of shit my dad was saying about me. And I was just flabbergasted. I was like, this is what he really thinks of me. Okay. Now, in the moment, I was very, very furious. Yeah. Rightfully but so. But if I'm looking back at it now, there was one line that stood out. I don't recognize my son anymore. And he was right. You know, wh- whatever his intentions were, he was right. I was a completely different person after my third deployment. Right. I was a completely different person after my second deployment. Um, I wasn't his son in the way that you know he knew me to be anymore um we had gone through so much we'd lost so many brothers you know we we experienced death giving taking life you know just everything everything about mortality we became extremely well versed in so it's very very hard to obviously go about your day to day and pretend that like everything's like a okay and you know huh. oh, i'm just gonna grab this cup of coffee and you know oh by the way i'm just gonna your brain's like i'm gonna throw this fucking memory from this firefight in there and it's like it's like nothing that they can ever understand and that's huh. that's something that i i try to um i try to explain to anybody who hasn't been in that kind of situation um and i'm, I'm kind of referring to like uh, i'll just call them civilians yeah um I, I hate using that term, but just normal people that haven't been through that. That's I'm tr- I, my mission now. Kind of like my goal is with our community raising awareness. You know, by telling my story and all the mistakes that I made and everything that I've been through, and also kind of like bridging the gap with civilians, because all we want to do, you know, myself included, is just come back and reacclimate into society. Absolutely. Like we we went overseas. We you know we we served voluntarily. We did our time. <clears throat> a lot of us have been through a lot of catastrophic shit, but we just want to we just want to be treated as normal fucking people. You know, like I mean, obviously you you got all those guys here and there that uh you know are over the top, like thank me for my service kind of shit. And yeah, that's a- they ride the train, and it's it's a little bit. I, that's that's how a lot of I think veterans were during the onset of the global war on terrorism. But now I think it's to a point where a lot of us are kind of getting sick and tired of those guys. And we're, we're all starting to have conversations about ourselves and our traumas and you know, how the fuck do we fix this? And we're getting into position like, uh, who's that gentleman that just won the seat in Congress, the the Um, seal, uh, Dan Crenshaw. Yeah. Like we're, we're that guy, we're getting into positions of, you know, office now and we're, we're the next generation that's going to be affecting a lot of change, you yeah. know, especially for veterans. So that's, that's kind of what I've, I've been dedicating myself to a lot. And I hope before I die, I make some kind of fucking impact in that in some way. Um, like I think you will, by the way, I, I hope so. I fucking hope so. Yeah. You know, because I, I, every single day I wake up, there's a lot of days where I, I literally can't get the fuck up for 30 minutes and I'm just laying on my back looking at the ceiling and I'm like, what, 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 what am I going to do today? 
I don't want to be around people. I just want to fucking sit here. Yeah. And then is that is the most draining part of my day is waking up. And it's it, that's why I sleep like shit because I know I'm going to wake up and be like fuck. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think that's part of uh that's part of the healing though in my opinion, right? Yeah. Because you have to expose yourself to the shit that you hate to do the most, you know? I think to be the most like well-rounded individual and whatever that may be, whether that be waking up and having to face the world and face like regular day-to-day people or whatever. Um, the fact that you show up is half the battle and, um, and it's commendable, you know? And, and even when you know, it's like, dude, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to have to face another day. Yeah. And this sucks, but, but you're a better we, man for doing it. You but know? we all do that. And that's, yeah. and that's a, a huge fucking struggle that a lot of people don't understand. And it's, it's very easy. And I understand the perception. Um, it get, it gets to a point where you, you a lot of uh, civilians view us as you know we were very standoffish you know we're very lethargic we were very depressed and anxious and and rightly so a lot of us are yeah. um there's a lot of side effects of byproducts of PTSD depression anxiety like there's a lot of you, you have a hard time interacting or trusting people um you have a hard time focusing on tasks like I, I, my short term memory is fucked a lot of days yeah yeah, I have to have a good night's sleep. I have to have been eating well for the past couple of days, had a few good workouts and been drinking a steady amount of water in order to function throughout the week. Like I, I need to stay on track. And that's part of the reason that um, I've been so successful at getting my shit done and getting out there and helping people and doing all the shit that I do now is because I started doing that. I got off the fucking couch. I yeah. stopped fucking drinking nonstop. I just I remember one day I, I remember looking in the mirror and I was like, what are you doing? You're you're a fat piece of shit. Like you're you're turning into an asshole. Yeah. You're not fuck you're sitting on the couch playing video games nonstop. What are you doing? I wasn't using my GI Bill. I wasn't doing anything for myself. Yeah. So I started to do something for myself. I'm like, this is gonna fucking suck. This is gonna be a mountain. Yeah. But I gotta start. Otherwise I'm never gonna start. So I started. I started meal prepping. That was the first step. I was like, I know nutrition is <clears throat> a huge component of losing weight. So I started eating right and, you know, put myself in a calorie deficit and I started fucking doing light workouts. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing when it came to working out my whole life. I still didn't. Um, and now I'm at a point where I'm very, very, you know, knowledgeable about the exercises and what they do and how to rest. And, you know, there's shit like deloading that I never would have thought about. <laughs> like it, it's so much science out there. And it's, it's like, really fucking yeah. complicated and it's, it's really cool, you know, and it, it helps, you know, take up a lot of my, my, my time. Like it, it, it keeps me busy. Um, I started doing that and then, you know, the We Defy Foundation dropped in my lap, which, um, I'm heavily involved in now. Uh, I just got told a few months ago hey we want you to be the northeast regional leader and i was nice, like oh, man yeah i was absolutely what is that what is the we defy foundation just so for the listeners <clears throat> the we defy foundation um it's for individuals who are either disabled um have ptsd you don't necessarily have to have any physical ailments mm -hmm. um you can apply and it's specifically designed to be therapy through brazilian jiu-jitsu um it's awesome and it's, it's been very helpful for me coming from a combat MOS. Um, it helps me get my aggression out in a, in a healthy way. Yeah. Um, versus, you know, going out and taking my anger out on individuals that don't deserve it. Yeah. Um, so they'll pay for your academy fees for a year. You know, you show continued commitment and everything like that. And they'll, you know, they'll keep supporting you. They give you two geese. Um, yeah, and, and where are they located? Are they nationwide? Or? It is literally where wherever you're located, they will find the closest school to you. They will contact that school. They'll say, "Hey, we have a veteran athlete. This is our our shtick. You know, this is what we'll do. This is what we'll give you. Would you be willing to take him on and be a We Defy affiliated school?" I've never heard of a school saying no. That's awesome. So man. they do that. They do a lot of the legwork. Um. There's, there's two guys that I work with a lot, Brian Marvin and Joey Bozick. Joey's a triple amputee, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, lost his, his both of his legs and one of his arms in a roadside bomb in Iraq. Wow. Um, Brian Marvin, 
he's um he's he's full bodied but he's got his own stuff from his time in service too yeah. these two gentlemen um you know they're like the top guys along with another gentleman alan shabaro um and they're basically the face of we defy and they've done so much for myself personally as well as you know countless other veterans all over the country and uh they were just here we did a seminar at tom de Blas's studio uh in forked river and it's called ocean county brazilian jiu-jitsu and we raised uh you know a lot of money um and we were uh, from what i was told we were able to get a couple veterans off the waiting list and that that kind of shit like i was saying before if one person gets helped like that that makes me happy like if if i can continue to do that kind of shit um that that's that it's making everything worth it so what's your uh your main gig now like what are you doing like what's your your main bread and butter um now i have well two jobs technically i work for the government for uh organization called nav air it's just like naval air weapon systems um i'm a civilian with them but then i also do uh, prosthetics testing with a company in Iceland called Oser, and I'll get flown out there, walk back and forth while they're analyzing data coming off the leg and everything, and yeah. it, it's that helps me. It's it's one. It's a nice place to get away to. It's only a five hour flight. The country is fucking beautiful. The culture is amazing. The people are amazing, but it it also helps me too in another way because I'm I know that me walking you know tripping on this prototype leg and you know doing this work is going to help another amputee down the road and that's just another you know cog in the fucking machine for me i like it man. it's another you know method of catharsis for me so and then you're doing some motivational speaking as well yes uh i did it for a while and then i kind of dropped off it and i just started getting back into it um i i have crippling anxiety yeah. when it comes to speaking in front of people it's very very difficult for me to speak in front of people um but it's getting a lot easier yeah. i mean shit i wouldn't have even entertained coming on a podcast you know two years ago but i mean i'm doing it now Here and yeah no it's 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 gotten easier to just share my message and share my story and you know get more involved with everything i i, I think that's legit though because i think that's where a lot of people fall off is that they get so scared of something that they just don't ever do it. Yeah. But then you realize when you start doing it, not only are you able to do it pretty effectively, yeah. but you also find that like you're re like you said, you're reaching just one person. Yeah. And that message is going to mean something to them. And yeah, you know, I shared something on Instagram and I always have a weird thing about doing videos on Instagram. I do very few videos on Instagram. Yeah. Um, cause I feel like I look like a dork on the camera. Yeah. I'm the same like, way, man. I, it's I, like, hate doing I just, it. I can't stand it. I feel awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. But part of that awkwardness, um, I'm just, you know, I, I interviewed a guy named Joshua Coburn and he's like, who gives a fuck, dude? Who cares what people think of you? Let go of the, the fear of judgment and all these other things. And yeah. you'll find that your life is so much more peaceful. And he was so right. So like, yeah, I did a video and his thing is like one take, one take only. Yep. You don't do it fucking five times, six times, yeah, yeah, yeah. one take. If you look <laughs> ridiculous, who gives a fuck? Yeah. And so that's what I'm working on. And like, I've made a personal goal for myself that like starting, you know, now, like I'm going to start doing video, like at least once, uh, one a week, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's actually going to start today because I just said it. So now it's public. So I'm, I have to do it now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did, I did a video talking about, uh, the stigma of mental health and I was nervous as fuck. And then like, I just did, I thought it sounded stupid and whatever. Yeah. I was like, fuck it, let it rip. I'm just going to post it. Yeah. And dude, the message that I got after posting that yeah. was like, it makes me cry sometimes. I'm like, dude, it's like, it's amazing. Cause it's, it's moving because it's like, wow. Like I didn't realize that me sharing this actually is actually reaching real people. Yeah. That makes a difference. And that's all I really care about. That's why I'm doing this podcast. That's why I'm like interviewing people because I know that your story is going to, people are going to hear it. Yeah, it's going to mean something to them and hopefully they'll get the help that they need, you know, I hope and, so, uh, and get outside the box, you know, and be like, Hey man, there's people out there that actually care, you know, that want to see you, uh, want to see what's best for you. You know, I really hope so. Um, <laughs> what's, uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. Okay. Um, first one being like all the shit that you went through and whether it be before the military, uh, during the military, after the military, if you had like one person or one thing, one book, <laughs> that was the most inspirational to you um what would it be and why or who would it be and why 
Well, it's a fairly recent one. It's my girlfriend, Christy. Nice. She, um, I know it sounds very, very cliche. Um, I had gotten to a point about a year and a half, two years. We had been together almost two years now. But right before I met her, I'd gotten to a point where I was about to, like, like the fulcrum was coming back around and I, I was at the bottom again. Yeah. And she, in manner of speaking, ripped the Band-Aid off. And she helped me realize that I was making excuses for myself and I was blaming everything around me. You know, I, I was, I had the mindset, well, this is happening to me and this is happening to me and this is happening to me. She's like, what's the common denominator? <laughs> it's you. Right. Asshole. Yeah. I was like, okay, fuck you. But that makes sense. You know, yeah, that's kind of totally, how, it, totally. so there was a lot of pushback and I was like really fucking, a lot of times I thought she was fucking with me or trying to like hold me back. And that, and that unfortunately is a lot of what I experienced in my previous two marriages and in all the relationships was like a lot of jealousy, a lot of animosity, a lot of like, you know, anytime I, I even attempted to like communicate my story on like social media, I it got shot the fuck down. Like, what are you fucking doing? And, 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 like, yeah. so the, for the longest time, that was another contributing factor. Like I was, I was kind of scared to even share this or talk about this because I, I feared people would look at me and think, oh, he's, he's just being a fucking asshole or he's just bragging or something like that. But then that, through therapy, through Christy pushing me and guiding me, um, and ultimately me deciding that I had to unfuck myself because at the end of the day you can get all the help in the world but yep. if you're not fucking willing to put in the work you're not willing to do it yourself so true you're not going to go anywhere you have to do it yourself everyone has to do it your fucking self there is no fucking magic cure for any of this shit yeah like you can you can it's it's good to have a good support system and get guidance and everything like that and that will get you close to where you need to go so I got to do the work though. But you still have to take that last fucking dive, that last step and pull your head out of your fucking ass. Go get a therapist. Go talk about the shit that's fucking bothering you day in and day out. Talk about what the fuck you've been through. There's nothing wrong with it. And you know, the more people lose this fucking, this attitude that therapy is going to fucking hold me back and you know, someone's going to know my deep dark secrets and shit like, well, therapists for one, they're, they're going to have your fucking back. They're going to help you Absolutely. translate all the fucking shit that you're doing they're going to help you understand they're going to help you process it they're there for you that's their fucking job yeah. like that's what they live and breathe for so if you're fucking listening to this and you still haven't gotten fucking therapy like my dumb ass didn't i didn't even get diagnosed for ptsd until 2015 that's insane that was like yesterday in the yeah. grand scheme of things yeah. i finally went and got diagnosed and everything I finally started going to therapy consecutively and it 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 paid dividends like it was it helped me you know it, one, the mental aspect of it is always the hardest part like I can deal with this I can hop around like a fucking pogo stick on one leg if I had to right. and I would deal with it like I would deal with the physical pain but the mental part is always the hardest Definitely. And that's the biggest hurdle that a lot of people just fucking quit on and that's unfortunately where you get guys turning to drugs, turning to alcohol, and just eventually fucking killing themselves. Yep. So I couldn't agree more, man. I think that's uh I wanted to start a website actually and someone already owns a damn website though called ownyourshit.com. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm plugging I'm plugging that right now. I don't <laughs> even know who that company is. I think they're out of Canada actually, but um I really think that that's true though. I think that the mental part of life whether it be you know a military horrible experience or whether it be a horrible life experience a horrible upbringing whatever until you own your shit i don't feel like you're ever going to be the fullest potential of what you can be yeah you can't you know and it's like whatever it is and so god bless people like christy that are coming into your life and saying like listen dude you know like yeah. don't be an asshole dude like own your shit and get the help you need man yeah. um so the next question is going to be uh if you had one regret your whole life, your biggest, biggest fucking regret, what would it be and why? I don't have any regrets. None? Nope. Why is that? Because it, everything that has happened to me has put me in the position I'm in now. And I, I needed all of those experiences, especially the bad ones. I would argue I'd need the bad experiences more in order to shape my outlook on life and shape who I am. Fuck yeah, I like it, dude. I, I really, I cannot, like, there may be instances where, like, the, 
you know, they, they sucked. Yeah. And I, you know, part of me is like, fuck, I wish I hadn't gone through that. But I do. I needed to go through those. Absolutely. I needed to handle all those things and I needed to experience just how truly shitty life can be yeah. at various moments throughout my life. Who do you think your like your target, like if you had a target audience, who would that be? Would it be like uh, veterans? Would it be um, veterans? Yeah. Us. So if, if that's the case, like if that, so veterans being your target audience, if you could say like, if you could give one life lesson to veterans that are uh, either veterans that are that are out now or guys that are just going into the military, um, what would that lesson be? And the reason I'm asking, I, I've I've toyed around this damn question like so much because I don't want it to sound like a total downer. Like, bro, what's your biggest regret? You know, it sounds like a total like terrible way to end a podcast, but it's more of a way to like learn from people to be like, yeah, damn man, like if I could do it all over again, man, mm-hmm. I would do that differently. And I'm always like pick, trying to pick people's brains. You know, I want to know, like, dude, like, what could what could I do? What could I do better as a dad? What could I do better as a husband? What could I do better as a friend? Yeah. And um, and always being set like self, like being introspective about things. You know. Yeah. So if there was something you could tell a veteran, you know, some of the experience that you went through, that you could tell them to kind of keep that, you know, they get to that that place in their life or their career or whatever where it's like, um, it could go either way. Like, what would that? What would the lesson be to them? Well, I would say don't quit. And I know that sounds very generic, but this is this is why I say it. Um it's going to suck. You know that, I know that. Like it, it like we all know that as veterans, like yeah. our time in service, even if you don't get into a lot of like heavy shit, yeah. it sucks. It's it's hard getting ripped out of that fucking camaraderie, that tribe when you get out. Yeah. And that's also a huge factor for a lot of us getting PTSD, combat notwithstanding. Like the, it's when you're ripped from all you know, your day in and day out routine, everything that was totally ingrained in you and you come out to society, what is perceived as normal society and no one operates like that. It's, it's a huge fucking culture shock. Like it's a culture shock getting into the military but then it's a culture shock getting out of the military. I don't think they prepare you for it. I don't think, I think no actually, amount that you have to go through it. Like right. that's the thing that a lot of people, there's, like I said, there's no fucking cure all for this. You, sh- you literally have to get out, go through this kind of shit. If you have a good support system, then you, you're already a step ahead, Right. but you need to go through this. You need to go through all the fucking pain, all the shittiness of getting out and dealing with your own shit but you do need to deal with your own shit. Just, if if there's one thing you fucking do, start seeing a therapist immediately. Yeah. If, you, if you're getting out of the service, even if you haven't been in combat, even if you just did four fucking years, you never deployed, and you're getting out, go see a therapist. Yeah. Because you have been ripped out of your life. I don't and think you're I, starting a new life. Yeah. I don't think you realize, I, I don't think I realized until I got out, like, the bonds that you have with people. You yeah. know what I mean? Like the bonds and the closeness and like the community. And it's like the buddy that I just went to go see uh, up here in New York. Yeah. Um, his, uh, his wife and I were talking about it. How it's like, she was like, you know, when I was in England, like that was like some of the best times of my life. Like I felt like the community there, like yeah. the way the wives took care of each other and like the kids and everybody was together. And like on the holidays, we were all together. It's like this sense of community that no one else understands really yeah. on the outside. So when you get out, like I know I had a hard time with it. Like even with guys I like, grew up with where i was like yeah they don't get the loyalty they don't understand like the the lengths that i'll go for yeah. like the people that i love and um and yeah it was definitely a culture shock so that's i think that's great advice man go to a counselor a therapist whatever and just talk to somebody you know yeah or find that support group that that works for you you know i mean i was i i'm case in point i was extremely afraid of going and getting help yeah. i was terrified i was afraid of getting a stigma attached to my name i was afraid of how people would look at me You know, I was afraid of how I would bring it up in conversation, how I would, you know, justify everything. And I eventually got to that point, like you had mentioned, where I just, I just said, fuck it. Like, I'm, I'm going to go get checked out. Let me fucking do this. And that was, you know, the, the, uh, it was a big step and owning your own shit is going to help you down the road. Like as, 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 as hard of a pill as it is to swallow, everyone needs to own their own fucking shit. Everyone needs to own what they've been through, the good, the bad, everything. Yeah. Once you start to do that, then you can start to figure out how to live your life in the way that you want 
you know, how to truly affect change, how to really fucking do what you want to do. Yeah. Let's see. That's about the best thing I can say. That and find your tribe is would be my, my yeah. next thing is find, find your tribe. Because I think when you, like for me, when I got out, um, a therapist asked me like, what, like, where do I feel the best? When do I feel the best? Where yeah. do I feel the best? And where do I feel the safest? And I, I was like on a military base with all my brothers. Yeah. And he like looked at me like all like kind of puzzled. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I'm being serious. Yeah. Cause I know at any moment, like if anything ever went down, like I, they have my six and I have theirs yeah. and I don't, I can, it's like, I felt like I could let my guard down. Yeah. I could be like at ease, you know? And, um, when you get out and you don't have that tribe around you, it's like, you're just floundering, dude. So I think that's great advice. And, um, and honestly, man, I'm, I'm super stoked that I was able to do this podcast with you. Thanks for having me, dude. And um, I truly think that your message is going to help a lot of people. And I, I think so. it's commendable that you're like sharing your message, man. You're getting out of your comfort zone and saying like, fuck anxiety. And I'm just going to go out there and put my message out there with the hopes that somebody's going to hear it and yeah. they'll get the help they need. Thanks, man. So thanks, brother. And uh, I look forward to seeing what you're, um, you're going to get into next. And where can people find you, by the way? Um, I really only use Instagram. Okay. Uh, it's R O R Y underscore Patrick underscore Hamill H A M I L L. Awesome, man. So if you guys need to get uh, in touch or you want to get in touch with Rory, you can hit him up on Instagram at, uh, at Rory underscore Patrick underscore Hamill. And, um, thanks for listening guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to my backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at here is my backstory.com.